Hi. Well, it's summertime here in New Zealand. Summer's just arrived, so uh, as you can see, I'm sitting outside. I've changed of venue. And uh, this is class five of the MOOC, the last class. Uh, here's a few comments on class four, some issues that came up. So we had a couple of errors in the activities. We corrected those pretty quickly. Some of the activities are getting harder. You'll have noticed that. But I think if you're doing the activities, you'll be learning a lot. You'll learn a lot through doing the activities. So keep it up, and class five activities are much, are much easier. There was a question about uh, converting uh, nominal variables to numeric in activity 4.2. Someone said the result of the supervised nominal to binary filter is weird. Yes, well, it is a little bit weird. If you click the more button for that filter, it says that k minus one new binary attributes are generated in the manner described in this book, if you can get a hold of it. Let me just uh, tell you a little bit more about this. So I've come up with an example of a, a uh, nominal uh, attribute called fruit. And it has three values, orange, apple, and banana. And in this data set, the class is juicy. It's a numeric class of juiciness. And I don't know about where you live, but in New Zealand, oranges are juicier than apples, and apples are juicier than bananas. So I'm assuming that in this data set, if you average the juiciness of all of the instances where the fruit attribute equals orange, you get a larger value than if you do this when the, for all the instances where the uh, fruit attribute equals apple, and that's larger than for banana. So that sort of orders these values. OK, so let's just consider ways of making fruit into a set of binary attributes. So the simplest method, and the one that's used by the unsupervised conversion filter, is the method one here. We create three new binary attributes. I just call them fruit equals orange, fruit equals apple, fruit equals banana. And the first attribute is one, if it's an orange, and zero otherwise. The second attribute, fruit equals apple, is one if it's an apple and zero otherwise, and the same for banana. So, of course, of these three binary attributes, it can't possibly happen that more than one of them, exactly one of them, has to be one for any instance. Here's another way of doing it in method two. We can take each possible subset, as well as orange, apple, and banana, we can have another binary variable for uh, orange or apple and another one for orange or banana, and another one for apple or banana. So for example, if the value of fruit was orange, then the first attribute would be one, that's the fruit equals orange, and the fourth attribute would be one, and the fifth attribute would be one, and all the others would be zero. So this effectively creates a binary attribute for each possible, for each subset of possible values of the uh, fruit attribute. Actually, we don't create one for the empty subset or the full subset with all three of the values in. So we get two to the k minus two uh, attributes for a k valued attribute. For a k valued, sorry, we get two to the k minus two values for a k valued attribute. That's impractical in general because two to the k grows very fast as k grows. And the third method is the one that's actually used and this is the one that's described in that book. We create two new attributes, k minus one in general for a k-valued attribute. Fruit equals orange or apple, and fruit equals apple. So for oranges, the first attribute is one, and the second one is zero. For apples, they're both one, and for bananas, they're both zero. It's assuming this ordering of the class values, orange, the largest juiciness and banana is the smallest juiciness. And there's a theorem that if you're making a decision tree, the best way of splitting a node for a nominal variable with k values is one of the k minus one positions. Well, you can read this. Uh, and in fact, this is reflected in method three. That is the best way of splitting these uh, attribute values. Now, whether that's a good thing in practice or not, well, I don't know. I mean, you should try it and see, you know, uh, perhaps this method three, you can try method three for the supervised conversion filter or method one for the unsupervised conversion filter and uh, see which produces the best results on your data set. Weka doesn't implement method two because the number of attributes explodes with the number of possible values and you could end up with some uh, very large data sets. Okay, the next question is, uh, 
about simulating multi-response linear regression. Please explain. <laughs> well, we're looking at uh, a Weka screen like this. Uh, we're uh, running linear regression on uh, the Iris data set where we've mapped the values so that the class for any Virginica instance, the class is one and zero for the others. And then we do that, so we've done it with this kind of uh, configuration. This is the default configuration of the make indicator filter. It's working on the last attribute, that's the class. And in this case, the value index could be, uh, well, in this case, it's last, uh, which means we're looking at the last value, which in fact is Virginica. We could put a number here to get the first, second, or third of the, uh, of the values. So that's uh, how we get the data set, and then we run, then we run linear regression on this to get a linear model. Now I want to look at the output here for the first four instances. We've got an actual class of 1, 1, 0, 0, and the predicted value of these numbers. And I've written those down in this little table over here, 1, 1, 0, 0, and these numbers. That's for the data set where all the Virginicas are mapped to 1, and the other irises are mapped to 0. When we do the corresponding mapping for Versicolors, we get this is the actual class. We just run Weka and look at what appears on the screen. And this is the predicted value. And we get these for Setosa. So you can see that the first instance is actually a Virginica, 1, 0, 0. And I've put in bold the largest of these three numbers. This is the largest point, 966. It's bigger than this and this. So multi-response linear regression is going to predict Virginica for instance number one. In fact, the largest value. And that's correct. Uh, for the second instance, it's also a Virginica, and this is also the largest of the three values in its row. For the third instance, it's actually a Versicolor. The actual output is uh, one for the Versicolor model. But the largest prediction is still for the Virginica model. So it's going to predict Virginica for an iris that's actually Versicolor. That's going to be a mistake. And in the third case, it's actually a Setosa. The actual column is one for Setosa. And this is the largest value in the row, so it's going to correctly predict Satota. So that's how multi-response linear regression works. Okay. How does 1R use the rules it generates? Please explain. Well, here's the rule generated by 1R. It hinges on attribute 6. And of course, if you click the edit button in the pre-process panel, you can get to see the value of this at attribute for each instance. Let's see if I've got them. Yes, so uh, this is uh, what we see in the Explorer when we run 1R. And you can see the actual and predicted, you can see the predicted instances here. These are the predicted instances. G, B, G, B, G, G. So these are the predictions. Now the question is, how does it get these predictions? This is the value of 6, attribute 6 for instance 1. And what the 1R code does is it goes through each of these conditions and looks to see if it's satisfied. Is 0 0.02 less than minus 0.2? No, it's not. Is it less than minus 0.01? No, it's not. Is it less than 0 0.001. No, it's not. It's surprisingly hard to get these right, especially when you've got all the other decimal places in your list here. Is it less than 0.1? Is 0 0.02 less than 0 0.1? Yes, it is. So rule 4 fires. This is rule 4 and predicts a G. So I've written down here the number of the rule, the clause of the rule that fires. So in this case, for instance 2, the value of the attribute is minus 0.4. And uh, that satisfies the first rule. So this satisfies number one, and we predict the B. And so on down the list. So that's what 1R does. It goes through the rule, evaluating each of these uh, clauses until it finds one that is true, and then it uses the corresponding prediction as its output. 
Moving on. Ensemble learning questions. There were some questions on ensemble learning about these 10 and 1R models. Let's see these 10 alternative ways of classifying the data. And, uh, well, in a sense, but they're used together. Adaboost M1 combines them. In practice, you don't just pick one of them and use that. Adaboost just combines these models inside itself. So the predictions it prints are produced by its combined model. The weights are used in the combination to decide how much weights to give each of these models. And when Weka reports a certain accuracy, that's the combined model. It's not the average. It's not the best. It's combined in the way that Adaboost 1R uh, combines them. So that's all done internally in the algorithm. And I didn't really explain the details of how the algorithm works. You have to look that up, I guess. But uh, the point is that Adaboost M1 combines these models for you. You don't have to think of them as separate models. They're all combined by Adaboost M1. Someone complained that we're supposed to be looking for simplicity, and this seems pretty complicated, and that's true. The real disadvantage of uh, these kinds of models, ensemble models, is that it's hard to kind of look at the rules. It's hard to see inside to see what they're doing. So perhaps you should be a little bit wary of that. But they can produce very good results. I mean, you know how to test machine learning methods reliably using cross-validation or whatever, so sometimes they're good to use. Uh, how does Weka make predictions? How can you use Weka to make predictions? Well, uh, you can use a supplied test set option on the classify panel to put in a test set and see the prediction of that. Or actually, there is a program, if you can run Java programs. Uh, there's a program here. In fact, this is how you run it. Java, this program with uh, your ARF data file, and you put question marks there to indicate the class, and then you uh, give it the model which you've uh, output from, uh, from the Explorer. So you can look, look at how to do this on the Weka wiki from the, on the FAQ list, using Weka to make predictions. Where are we? Can you bootstrap learning? Someone talked about some friends of his who are using training data to train a classifier and using the results of classification to create further training data and continuing the cycle, kind of bootstrapping. And that sounds very attractive, but it can also be unstable. It might work, but I think you'd be pretty lucky for it to work well. It's a potentially rather unreliable way of doing things, believing the classifications on new data and using that to uh, further train the classifier. He also said uh, these friends of his don't really look into the classification algorithm. And I guess I'm trying to tell you a little bit about how each classification algorithm works because I think it really does help to know that. You should be looking inside and thinking about what's going on inside your data mining method. A couple of suggestions for things not covered in this MOOC. Uh, the filtered classifier and uh, association rules, the a priori association rule learner. And as I said before, maybe we'll produce a follow-up MOOC uh, and uh, includes topics like this in it. Okay, that's it for now. Class 5, it's the last class. It's a short class. Go ahead and do it, and uh, please uh, complete the uh, assessments and uh, finish off the course. It'll be open this week, and it will remain open for one further week if you're getting behind, but after that, it will be closed. So you need to get on with it. We'll talk to you later. Bye.